Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, hello everybody and uh, thank you for joining me here. Uh, I will be talking to you about Elm today. Uh, this is going to be an introductory talk about the language and I'll also be sharing about our experience in using a language like this to build a uh, real world application. And yeah, I'm not actually going to go uh, serve tea or something, uh, that just stands for the Elm architecture. So a bit about myself, uh, my name is Ritesh. Uh, a couple of months back, I joined uh, Big Binary as a senior software engineer. And we wanted to build a product that would provide uh, contextual help documents to the users. And we call this product Ace Help. So this is still like in the very uh, early stages. And uh, let me give you a quick overview of what Ace Help is and what we wanted to achieve with it. So for the sake of an example, let's assume that uh, you have a web app to upload and edit videos or something. And you wanted to provide uh, some helpful documentation to your users, guides, so to speak. So what you could do is you could, you know, sign up on Ace Help, create your documentation uh, by following a few simple steps. I won't go into the details. Uh, and once you have your documentation ready, then you can get a JavaScript code snippet, which you can then insert in your app or website. Uh, this is much like, you know, how you would integrate uh, uh, Google Analytics or Intercom or, or something like that. So once you've done that, a small uh, button or a help icon would render in your website. Uh, the user can then click on this icon uh, and this would open up this widget which would, you know, uh, give, uh, provide the help documents, uh, documents for your user. Now, one important feature uh, of uh, this product, Ace Help, is that it provides these help documents based on a certain context, rather than uh, the user just having to search through, uh, you know, a repository of things. So it takes into consideration uh, things like uh, the current location or the URL of the user that's, you know, uh, uh, the, that the user is right now in and suggest some uh, articles to the user based on these parameters. So yeah, I, I mean, that's just, that's the gist of the uh, application, uh, that, uh, the gist of his help. And these are all mock screens, so you don't have to worry about this. Now, we knew that the front end would win involve a fair bit of work, and uh, there were two parts to it. One was developing the widget side code, which would reside in the, uh, you know, the client uh, website. And the other is developing the uh, admin side, where, you know, the users would sign in and create your documentation and stuff. So, yeah, the front end, right? Uh, I mean, there are a number of frameworks and libraries out there that we could have adopted. And these are just amongst the, you know, the popular ones. I'm not even sure if people use MobX, but that, yeah, that's that. And, uh, and these days it's quite difficult to pick one, right? Most of the frameworks have evolved over the years and they've come a long way. And you really have to look at certain other aspects to pick the right one for you. Uh, that being said, we do quite a bit of work with React within Big Binary. And we like React and its uh, ecosystem a lot. But this is all still, you know, JavaScript. And we knew that if we relied on JavaScript and any of its framework and tooling, uh, it would still bring in issues that inherently exist within the JavaScript world. And as the code base grows, it's only a matter of time that these issues, you know, start cropping up. So if you've dabbled with uh, front-end development, then for sure you must have faced issues like, for example, with null or, you know, undefined is not a function. And JavaScript is inherently impure and mutable. Now, this is not just me being pro FP here and, you know, bashing JavaScript, but it's a known fact that uh, this leads to unpredictable behavior and uh, bugs. Now, there are measures, uh, again, that we can take to curb these problems. 
TypeScript and Flow, uh, for example, gives us static type checking, right? And it's great. But again, there are times uh, where we need we where we need JavaScript's uh, dynamism to work for us. Or rather, as front-end developers, we tend to fall back on JavaScript's dynamic nature to, you know, for shortcuts. So both these uh, systems, they give us the any type, which essentially allows us to escape the whole type checking altogether. And sometimes functions become rather complex and it's really hard to determine what the type signature should be like. This might be because uh, the function itself is impure in nature, might be mutating some external state or doing multiple things, you know, within. And of course, we can use other libraries and, you know, tools to further enforce things in our code base, use immutable data structures, linters, and build up some discipline. Uh, but even that might not be enough. So this is a recent screenshot of the Slack app uh, captured by one of my colleague at uh, Big Binary. Uh, yeah, see what I'm saying here? So now I'm not really hating on JavaScript here. I love the language. I still use it. It's super flexible, multi-paradigmed, but due to JavaScript's inherent nature, or rather maybe it's uh, right to say due to our human nature, the cost of this flexibility can be quite high for us, uh, especially when it comes to software development. And if you don't handle it well, it can get really hard to feel confident about our code, especially as the code base grows. So when we look at Acehelp as a product where we need to get integrated with the user's website, or app to display the help widget and to provide help documents to their users, it becomes especially important for us to avoid uh, you know, such kind of issues. It definitely would not speak uh, well about the product if, if these kind of issues did crop up and spoil the uh, entire user experience of the website. So what do we do? Well, there were a couple of choices out there to tackle uh, these challenges. But for us, one particular candidate stood out, Elm. Uh, why? Well, a quick look at the uh, Elm website and the feature that's enlisted uh, at the top is no runtime exceptions. Now that's a pretty bold claim in well, uh, front-end land. Actually, there are some cases and known issues where it may not guarantee this, but for the most part, it does. There are a bunch of other features too, like great performance and small asset size. Now this is the, uh, uh, so the Elm real world application uh, that compiles to like one third of the size of the React version, which is pretty impressive. And there are, you know, a couple of more benefits. So what is Elm? Elm is a functional programming language for uh, declaratively creating web apps. It compiles to JavaScript. So in a typical Elm app, you would have a bunch of modules, Elm modules and an entry point. You then compile it down to a single output, which would, uh, which would have the uh, JavaScript code. Now the output is not meant to be human readable. The point here is that the compiler would do the best job for you and you don't have to worry about it. As I said before, it's a purely functional language. It has strong static and uh, type inference. Elm has a huge emphasis on being uh, beginner friendly. There is a learning curve. Uh, but as a functional programming language, it does not bog you down with a lot of things, but just enough to get you started, you know, thinking in a certain way. So you won't find uh, like funky terminologies that usually you, that are used by, you know, functional programmers. Uh, so it's a bit easy on you. Okay, let me give you a typical example. This is a 
add function in JavaScript, right? And here is the same function in Elm. So the syntax, as you see, is uh, you know worlds apart from JavaScript. Uh, it might it it is actually more close to Haskell, uh, and there is a bit of getting used to here. Uh, but once you do, it's actually fun. So we define a function called add, and it takes two arguments x and y. But notice that uh, we separate them with white spaces, and uh, there is no parenthesis or comma. And uh, and that way, it's a bit more terse than uh, JavaScript. Notice also that there is no you know opening and closing curly brackets or anything like that. In fact, the function itself is a single uh, expression. There is no concept of uh, multiple statements and you know a, a return keyword or anything like that. And this is how you invoke a function. And since all functions in Elm are pure, which means it cannot mutate any external state, and it purely depends upon you know the values that are passed to the function. And that gives us strong guarantees uh, in the sense that whenever we call this function, uh, we are sure to get back, you know, what uh, what is otherwise expected. So this function gives. You know, this would always be ten. Okay, so let's try. Let's say we implemented that function, which would display that uh, bit of text in the Slack app that we saw. View all, you know, some number of users or members. Here is a here is the uh, JavaScript version. Again, it's quite simple, but let's let's just examine this. So, if we pass a list of users or you know an array of usernames, we get the expected result. But what happens when we pass it nothing or a number? And as we saw in yesterday's flash talk, uh, if the implementation was slightly different, uh, we could get all sorts of unexpected. Uh, results. Okay, so let's try to do the same thing in Elm. Uh, so if we, I mean, uh, you can just have a look at the code. There's nothing much going on here. It's pretty much the same as what the JavaScript code did. Uh, so if we pass the right values, we obviously get the expected result. If we try to call the function with another type, let's say an integer. The compiler would throw an error. So this is Elm's uh, type inference coming into play here during the compilation process, and it notifies us that we uh, we are not passing the right type of ar argument. This code will never compile, and it would never make it to the user's screen. Okay. So what happens if we don't handle the else condition, which is very well possible in JavaScript? Uh, but the thing is, in Elm, this this whole if else thing is one single expression, and it has to be complete. The compiler basically forces us to uh, handle all conditions, and if you don't do that, obviously you'll get an error. And this gives us, you know, strong guarantees again. Right. So all functions in Elm are Carried by default. So if we go back to the add function, and if you call the add function by just giving it one argument, you would get back another function which is you know waiting for the final argument. So you can create an add five function which expects just one argument and you know just adds five to it. So we saw that Elm can figure out types, it can infer types, and it is pretty accurate at it. But it also lets you write a type annotation on the line above the uh, type definition if you want. So uh, here's how you would define a float, a string, uh, a bool, and a list of you know integers. And the way we do it is quite simple. You you just have the identifier followed by a colon and you know the type. And this is how you would define. You know the type signature for functions, uh, and this you know introduces arrows. So if you look at the half function, the way we read it is from left to right. So it takes in a float and returns a float. 
and the way uh, and we ha and when we have like multiple arguments for example the divide function so how you would read that is it takes a float as the first argument then it returns another function which takes another float and that function finally returns a float right uh, and as uh, you know hari said this is also using the uh, hindley milner type system now people can make uh, mistakes while defining type annotations so what happens uh, if we say the wrong thing well the compiler will still figure it out for you and you know try to do try to match the right thing for you and it would even suggest you know it should be a float instead of a int in this case in other words the compiler will always verify that all the annotations are correct okay so in a help you can create this articles right and articles can have a title a description categories urls and a bunch of other things right so elm allows you to create something called as type aliases uh, to represent something like this and which is nothing but defining the shape of the you know re the record type and this is how you would uh, actually create a type of article which we defined in the previous slide it's pretty similar to how you create an object in javascript except uh, we use the you know equal to sign instead of the colon sign and we can use this in our type signature as well so let's say we have a function which takes in a list of articles and returns uh, a list of and extracts the title out of it and you know a list uh, returns a list of uh, title uh so yeah so this is how you would define that and uh, notice the dot title method over there a function over there so that's the same as you know calling article dot title it's it's just that uh you have record field accessors as functions also in l yeah so this basically just extracts the value out of uh, the record and and that that's it so elm has a pipe operator that sort of relies on partial application for example say we have a function that takes an article extracts the description uh, truncates it and adds an ellipsis right to get a short summary so to speak now a better way to represent this is by using the pipe operator so in this pipeline uh, we pass the initial input to the dot description function and then the output of that gets passed to the truncate function and the, finally that the output of that gets passed to add ellipsis and uh, yeah and that the bar and the greater than sign is how you represent the pipe operator on similar lines we also have an uh, an operator to compose functions uh, the only difference being here is that we do not pass the initial uh, input to the pipeline and by doing so it's you know it's it's a it's known that uh, we return a function that's waiting for an input and obviously the operator is different right so all data in elm is uh, immutable so this article type it gets passed around a lot in a lot of functions in our repo in um, you know acl so if you wanted to create a function that takes in an article uh type and we wanted to update it to something new uh, we wanted to update the title to something new uh, the way we would do that is by copying the original article and so here we are saying that you know take the original article keep all the other fields as it is but for the title set it as the new title i mean that's how you would work with uh, records now the benefit of doing this is that uh, there is going to be a flow of data without worrying that some random function might be uh, you know mutating the original value which is otherwise possible in javascript and these are sources of bugs that can be quite tricky and difficult to track down all right 
custom types. So in ACE help, uh, an article could have this status, which can either be active or inactive. So if the article is active, it, it will be displayed in that widget. And if it's inactive, it won't be. And the admin users can set the status of the article as active or you know, inactive. Now we could use strings to you know, represent this status, but then we have to check the value of the string to be you know, equal to the string active or inactive. And we'd be concerned about upper cases or lower cases. And what if you know, there are typos? And what if the value changes altogether? So we might have to do some run, run, runtime validation to take care of this, right? So a better way to represent this status is using a custom type. So I can have a status type, which is either active or inactive. And now I only need to deal with these two variants of this type. So if I have to set the status of the of, the, of an article as active or inactive, I just use one of these uh, variants that we defined in the previous slide. Right? And uh, yeah, so you just set it as one of these uh, variants and you your your status type is now type checked. So if we give it any other value, the compiler will fail. And thereby we can just avoid, you know, writing a lot of runtime validation code. Okay, so let's say uh, that we requested for an article from the server, but that article does not exist and the server returns a null, right? But sometimes, but sometimes we need, uh, yeah, so basically Elm does not really have a, it does not have a null or anything equivalent to a null. Uh, but sometimes we need to represent this, right? We need to represent no data. So how do we do that? So one way to do this is by using the uh, maybe custom type, which is sort of built in with the core library. And uh, the variance of this maybe type is just either, yeah, just a value or nothing at all. So notice the A here. That's, that's a variable type, which is to say that the type constructor of just takes, you know, any type. So it's like a boxing type. It, it, uh, so, uh, it's a little difficult to explain this. It, uh, it, yeah, that's what it does. It just wraps around uh, some type, some other type. So we can have a maybe of int, a maybe of a string, float, or you know, even a maybe of an article. Yeah, so this is, so we can have a default article, which is just some empty value, or we can have nothing at all. But the thing is that we will have to deal with both these cases now. So let's say somewhere uh, in the view, we wanted to display some text, if the article was found or not found, uh, then we can use this case expression to do this. So this is basically a fancy sort of way to do uh, switch cases. Uh, so the incoming article can have, uh, can come in two variants, right? And it can come in only two uh, different variants, the just and nothing, since it is a maybe type. So the case expression allows us to do what is called as pattern matching. And you can just, you know, sort of do this by uh, branching out into these two types. Yeah, so, so basically this allows us to have like, uh, this will always return a string no matter what. So yeah, so that's a basic overview of the syntax and how certain things work in L, but it just, it, it doesn't end with just that. Okay, so in today's day and age, what do we need to do uh, to build a fairly large front-end application? You need some kind of a package manager, a compiler or a, and a module bundler, 
some kind of a framework to hold things together and a bunch of other libraries and tools to you know to be careful about our code and avoid bugs now this can be a pretty daunting task to you know wire all this together uh, to get things going especially for a beginner uh, when you don't really understand what these different components might be doing so in elm there is an equivalent of what you know all the things that we saw in the previous slide uh, built in so it has its own compiler package manager repl and a dev server it also has its own uh, built in framework which is the elm architecture and it enforces this architecture to build you know uh, web applications the the working is actually pretty similar to redux as you can see in fact the uh, the creators of redux uh, also mentioned that redux was inspired by uh, the elm architecture in some way so so uh, elm applications can basically take over a single uh, node in a larger application or they can cover like the take care of the entire document so to speak so you set up your app through what's called an elm program and that this is the core of the uh, elm architecture and it lets you uh, define one of these programs using these helper functions so uh, you can have a sandbox this is primarily just there for you to learn and understand the basics of the elm architecture it's solely there for that purpose and then you have something called as an element function which also lets you create a program basically this will allow you to create an uh, just one uh, html node which is managed by elm so you can you know easily integrate into larger applications that are, that are not built in elm uh then you have the document type which lets you take care of the entire document elm manages it for you basically that includes the title and the body as well and finally we have the application type of program which is like the real deal it lets you do that's what you you would use to build a single page application so you can do route, routing and stuff like that okay so if you look at the uh, type signature for the sandbox function it has one argument and it takes in these three uh, different parts and so you have the init uh, thing which which basically takes in a model which which is which is the state of the app and uh, it would hold the data of the app then we have the view which is a function which takes in the model and returns an uh, html message we we'll look at that uh, briefly in the next slide and then you have the update function which takes in a message or some user action then it takes the uh, current model and returns us the updated model okay so if we create a, a sandbox program from a high level it would look something like this you have the elm runtime within which your application would reside and the elm runtime is going to manage the data flow for you so even the html that you define in your uh, uh, application is managed by elm and it's not even like real uh, html it's virtual dom uh, the elm runtime would you know finally figure out uh, the actual html so the basic flow would look something like this and this is very simplistic representation of it so you have the initial model which would give out the view then you can have event uh, basically user actions or you know something like that which would which would trigger an update and that would finally update the model which would in turn uh, return uh, the updated view i mean we're all familiar with this sort of a flow so in in the sandbox program uh, you you do not have access to the outside world at all so you cannot do like some something like ajax requests or anything like that uh you can just you know 
describe the uh, HTML. So how do you cause side effects? I mean, if you don't do side effects, you don't really have a real application, right? So if you look at the type signature for the element function, which also gives uh, a program, an Elm program, there are a couple of changes. Uh, it introduces something called as subscriptions, which you know takes a model and some returns something called as sub message. We uh, we won't look at that right now. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the init and the update uh, uh, methods are also different here. So uh, so the the return type of both init and update is uh, right now modified. It instead of just returning a model, it right now returns something called as a command message, and we'll look at that. So unlike the sandbox uh, program, the Elm uh, sorry the element program uh, can communicate with the outside world in a couple of ways. You can use commands to trigger the Elm runtime to do HTTP requests. You can subscribe to events like clock ticks. You can pass in data from JavaScript through flags as the Elm program starts. And then finally, you can interrupt with JavaScript using something called as ports. Right. So basically, you can essentially fire a command to do an HTTP request to the server. And once that gets completed, that would trigger an update with the with the message and the payload, and then you can, and that would again uh, update the model and update the view finally. Right, so that's a very basic uh, overview of the Elm architecture. And one other thing that I wanted to share with you was about you know a great refactoring experience that you get with Elm. Okay, so. So you have this article type, right? And in ACELP, uh, the shape of this article type went through multiple iterations. So initially when we defined, uh, it could just have, the article could just be assigned to one single category. But then later we changed it uh, so that it, has mul it can be assigned to multiple uh, categories or a list of categories. Then we added something called as URL data to this article type. So the thing is that, I mean, th this whole thing gradually happened uh, over a period period of time. And as the requirements changed and, you know, a lot of things happened. But all we had to do really was, you know, change the type definition. And the compiler would obviously complain. But this acted as guides, so to speak, uh, so that uh, it would allow us to make changes in uh, uh, throughout the code base. And no corner cases were missed, uh, primarily. So this is otherwise such a huge issue because it is something, uh, if you're not careful enough in JavaScript, it could cause bugs and eventually that would finally land up in the uh, user screen. Okay, so this might seem like a lot, and yes, there is a learning curve, but at the same time, I've seen a couple of people, a lot of people just, you know, catch on uh, to the language pretty fast. It's just that the initial uh, effort that you need to put to understand the, the syntax and there are a couple of things that can be a little difficult if you're not used to this sort of a language. Uh, yeah, it's it does it does take some time, but you can get over it. And one important thing is that when you're writing applications in Elm, you are building for the long-term benefits, uh, especially when in terms of maintainability. And it's obviously safety first, but and you end up. Uh, building applications that are very predictable in behavior. It is highly opinionated. And it can sometimes feel uh, very restrictive at times, especially when you're interrupting with JavaScript or the outside world. Uh, 
I might also add that it has a great community. Uh, so the Elm Slack channel basically is always active. There is always uh, someone there. You can easily reach out to people if you're stuck and there's always something, someone there to uh, help you. And this was a recent tweet by Richard Fledman, uh, who works at NoRed Inc, where they have like uh, about 200,000 lines of uh, Elm code in production. And yeah, so after two years, that's when they finally encountered uh, a runtime expect, uh, error. And that too, it was because of, you know, uh, debug dot crash. So yeah, th so basically, that's the kind of reliability that you get from the, uh, by using, by working with this sort of a language. Incidentally, uh, the creator of Elm, uh, Evan Sis, uh, Sapliki, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, also works at Noted Inc. Okay, so how do you get started? Uh, you can visit the Elm Lang website. Uh, it's, it has like great documentation and then you can also visit the guides.elmlang website. It does a great job of uh, onboarding users to the language. Uh, great documentation again. There's the Elm Spa example by Richard Fledman. That's a great resource if you wanted to look at uh, the code of a real uh, uh, of a real world application. And then finally, ASELP is it's also open source. Uh, you can have a look at that, or you can just talk to me. So in conclusion, I would like to say that in today's day and age, uh, there are a great variety of tools and frameworks and languages available to build great uh, front-end applications. And when, it's, when, it, when it is a question about building reliable, robust front-end applications, Elm is one such language that should not be ignored. Thank you.